It's a joy to be all together to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Great Lakes Compact becoming state and federal law. I'm David Nafsker. I'm the executive director for the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. And I want to thank the University of Michigan for partnering with us to host today's event. Uh, it's been really fun to talk with a number of the students. Uh, a number of the negotiators from the Great Lakes Compact are here, and we should have a really entertaining and interesting conversation with you this morning. I would like to introduce Professor Drew Gronwald with the University of Michigan to make some brief opening remarks and uh, really looking forward to being all together and talking about some really important issues facing our region and the future of water. Professor Gronwald. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to everyone for being here and coming out here early on a Friday morning. Again, my name is Drew Grunewald. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Michigan. I'm also proud to be the director of the new Global Center for Understanding Climate Change Impacts on Transboundary Waters, an NSF-funded initiative that will be launching here in January. So on behalf of the University of Michigan and our organizing committee and the sponsoring partners for this event, I wanna welcome you to what I believe is the first ever symposium celebrating the Great Lakes Compact, and it just so happens to coincide with its 15th anniversary. Before going any further, I wanna make sure I thank some individuals without whom this event would not be possible, including the co-chairs of this event, my colleague, John Allen, as well as Dave Nasker and Pete Johnson, along with several students who have worked tirelessly, not only the past couple of days, but several weeks and even months to make this event possible. Most notably, PhD student Viene Rueda and also Ian Stone, who will be up here at the podium in just a moment. I also wanna make sure we thank several of the staff from the School for Environment and Sustainability who have helped make this event possible, including in particular, Amy Novak and Carol Love, who are here from our communications team, as well as behind the scenes, Scott Culver, and also um, Sushila Fernandez, who made this all possible. I think it's also important to acknowledge that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the hard work of many people in this room many years ago, developing and ensuring that the compact was enacted. So thank you for being here. We look forward to hearing you from you in the panel discussions in just a few moments. So with, as, I acknowledge, as we acknowledge the origins of the compact, I think it's important to segue into what I believe are two important guiding questions for today's event, one of which has been raised repeatedly over the past couple of days, as well as the past several months and years, which is, will the Great Lakes Compact withhold the test of time on a continent where there's a growing gradient between water scarcity and abundance? Now, are there are many folks in the room who believe the answer to that question is clear, and there are others who are gonna be discovering the answer to that question for the first time today. But I believe there's a second and more important question that we're here today to answer, which is, how will students and scientists over the next 10 to 20 years, both within the Great Lakes Basin and outside of the Great Lakes Basin, develop their own understanding of the answer to that first question? It is absolutely critical, I believe, that students and scientists know where to go to understand the history of the compact and how it was formed. So that brings us back to where we are today, which is that our hope is that today's discussion will provide a solid foundation for an understanding of the compact's origins and provide some insight into answers to those previous questions. I wanna thank you all again for being here today. I wanna to thank Dave and Pete for helping organize this with us and to all of our student help. And with that, I wanna turn it over to our student, Ian Stone, who will be introducing our next speaker. So thank you, and this is Ian Stone. All right, thank you, Drew. So I am the aforementioned Ian Stone. I'm a second, a little closer, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so my name is Ian Stone. I'm a second year master's student here at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. Uh, and so it's my pleasure uh, to welcome our first speaker of the day today, Frank Etowagizic. Uh, Frank has served in tribal elected office for nearly two decades, many of which uh, were as the tribal chairman of the Little Traverse Bay Band, our bands of Ottawa Indians. As tribal chairman, Frank was key to the adoption of the Tribal and First Nations Great Lake Water Accord in 2004 and the United League of Indigenous Nations Treaty in 2007. Frank is currently the executive director of the United Tribes of Michigan, the chairman of the Le our United League of Indigenous Nations Governance Board, and the co-chair of the National Congress of American Indians Federal Recognition Task Force. 
uh, and currently serves on several nonprofit boards, including the Association uh, on American Indian Affairs, the Anishinaabe Moen TAG, and the Michigan uh, Indian Educational Council. Uh, so please, well, please join me in welcoming uh, Frank Edward Isaac to the stage. Good morning. I was asked to open with a few, uh, with a, an invocation and words from our culture, and I'm going to begin with that. Ani, pipi guau do dem waganuk sing and donjuba, nakwe gijik dijnakas. We thank the Creator for this beautiful day. We thank the Creator for this opportunity for us all to be together on this momentous occasion. Thank the Creator for safe travel for everybody who's here, uh, and for all those who may witness the recordings of this event. We wish blessings on them as well. We thank the Creator for our homes and families, for our neighborhoods, our communities, our nations, and for all the things that we're able to do working together as we work for those coming generations, not just this current generation, but those ones yet to come. We thank the Creator for all the blessings in our lives. Miigwech, 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 miigwech. The, one of the things that you heard in that introduction was the Tribal and First Nations Great Lakes Water Accord. And that was uh, the effort by the tribes to become part of the compact negotiations. The tribes and First Nations in Canada and, the, and in the U.S had attempted to be, uh, to be part. We had gone to the state, uh, both not, not just in Michigan, but in New York and the province of Ontario, people had, the tribes had, had tried to join this, the, these discussions. And we were treated as the public, and we were given the notice the same time that the Farm Bureau and other nonprofits were given notice on this. And so what happened was is that we felt that, that our voices were not being properly heard because the tribes and First Nations have uh, had, under the courts in both Canada and the U.S., had property rights and had treaty rights that were involving these same resources. So what we did is we got together and we had a meeting in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, we invited all 185 tribes and First Nations in the Great Lakes Basin to this meeting. <coughs> and at that meeting, uh, we invited Michigan and Ontario to attend as observers, just the way they were inviting us to attend some of their meetings on occasion. Uh, and so we were, uh, this was an important meeting because at that meeting, we developed and signed this Tribal and First Nations Great Lakes Water Accord. And after over two years of discussions of trying to become part of the negotiations, within 24 hours, we were invited to the table. Because we had signatories representing about 120 of the tribes and First Nations that were in the Great Lakes Basin, either singly or in consortium. We subsequently had 30 additional nations sign on with, a, with a statements, notarized statements following that. So this is a really strong statement talking about the importance of our rights and the importance of how this we're supposed to be part of what's going on. With that, it started a process that has turned out to be uh, quite productive for all of us in terms of how we're able to work together. Uh, but the, one of the most important parts about what, you know, the, the, the view that Native people have is that we're not talking about property rights so much. Because when we, when my ancestors signed treaties for fishing, for example, they didn't look out at the waters and say, those are our fish. What they did is they looked out at the waters and said that they wanted to preserve the right to fish. And preserving the right to fish meant the right to sing for the fish, to dance for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, to pray for the fish, but to live with the fish. It's a relationship right. 
Well, that relationship right with the fish is not just with fish, but those rights that we worked on preserving, those rights are with the night sky. They're with the air, the earth itself, the medicine plants, all the other beings. That we have a relationship there. We don't own anything. Rather, we live with. And that's the viewpoint that we brought to the negotiations. And it's the thing that we have to work on protecting. So for Native people, you know, when we think of the four directions and the teachings, we think of, you know, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual in the, you know, the, each of the directions. And then we think of earth, fire, wind, and water. And these are all the elements that make up our world, our life, and how we react with each other. But they're not things that we own, rather that we live with. And this is the this worldview that we have had to work to try to bring to the negotiations for the compact. But we've, we're bringing it all across the world to this very day. In Dubai today, we have over 200 indigenous people that are there trying to take a similar message to the negotiators on climate right now. We're working on other issues with on, on access to water all around the world. This example of what we put together here, we've heard it said last night, and we'll see, and we can hear it again, countless. This is a shining example of getting together and working on an issue before there was an abject crisis. Well, I think that the, that the rest of the world can learn from that, and I think it's something that we need to do and we need to feel good about. And I'm looking forward to the discussions today. This has been, uh, for me, uh, when I was first elected as tribal chairman at Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, one of the elders came up to me and just stood in front of me and looked at me for a while, and then he said, you're going to protect the water. Well, you know, that's a charge. We listen to our elders. And so I started working pretty hard to try to figure out how was I going to do that. And uh, I'm still doing it. So today I, I serve on the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Board for the International Joint Commission. I'm on the Great Lakes Advisory Board for the EPA and the Water Use Advisory Council for the state of Michigan. All of those have interactions. They're not all exactly the same topic, but they all have interactions with each other. And they're rooted in the same concept and ideas that we have in this cooperative agreements, this, this compact and the agreement, the, the international agreement, uh, this whole idea that these Great Lakes are something that we live with it's essential, water is life, we don't own it. But on the other hand, we can't live without it. And so all of these things that we have today are, is just a few words for opening here that I wanted to share about some of the Native American views on how we look at, how we look at the world and how we think about uh, protecting that water. So with that, uh, I say miigwech, thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn this back over, thank you. Meg Watch Frank, uh, I think you have lived up well to the charge that your elder gave you. I recall the meetings you're talking about where we invited some of the tribes and First Nations to our table. And then uh, Sam Speck, the director of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the chair of our working group, and I were invited to their table uh, in Niagara Falls. And as we entered this grand ballroom with hundreds of people from the tribes and the First Nations, uh, Frank was there. and we were invited to smoke a pipe, 300 year old pipe uh, with the First Nations and the tribes and listen and learn from, from them. And I can tell you it made a huge impression on us and that sense of history and the different relationship to the water uh, than we had been talking about in our technical and scientific uh, meetings. So thank you very much for the work you've done, the perspective you've brought. Uh, I think we're all stronger and better for it. So thank you, Frank. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Vianne Rueda, who's been working with us over the past several months uh, to put together this event. She's a PhD student and she is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Vianne? Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I am a second year PhD. 
student here at the University of Michigan in the School for Environment and Sustainability. And it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. Congresswoman Dingell represents Michigan's 6th Congressional District, and she is a member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and the House Committee on Natural Resources, where she leads on critical issues like in energy, environmental quality, and water. As a Michigan native and a co-chair of the Great Lakes Task Force, Congresswoman Dingell has an appreciation for the environment and has become a strong advocate for the outdoors. She understands that the Great Lakes are an important freshwater system and she advocates for their protection from pollution, climate change, invasive species, and harmful algal blooms. Congresswoman Dingell also recognizes the need for affordable clean water. With the help of colleagues, she recently introduced the Water Access Act, directing $500 million to the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program for fiscal year 2024. She has also led the fight against PFAS contamination, spearheading the PFAS Action Act. Congresswoman Dingell is known for her close work with local community leaders to find solutions to critical issues most relevant to hardworking families. As we celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Great Lakes Compact, it is an honor to have an environmental advocate that recognizes and appreciates the importance of the Great Lakes and water more generally. Please join me in giving Congresswoman Dingle a warm welcome. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I hope you can hear me. I've been yelling at Republicans too much. <laughs> <clears throat> they need it. Uh, it's really good to be here this morning and to see a lot of people I've worked with over the years, to see people from around the Great Lakes, from Canada, and then the students who really are trying to learn. And this, I'm really grateful for the opportunity and to be asked to speak at the 15th anniversary of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Camp Compact and to discuss the joint efforts uh, that everybody here has really participated in to protect our natural resources. Frank, your comments were so inspiring and remind us all, while the compact is, is very important, has a very specific goal, protecting our waters is one of them, it, it is life. It's, I've screamed it at the president when I was trying to make sure during the pandemic, no one had to pay for water. Water is life. And it, it really matters about protecting it. And thank you to the university. I wasn't the president I was yelling at. It was his chief of staff who, <laughs> who, who I, I mean, this is a true story. I, I, I didn't want people evicted from their homes. So that was a, a public health emergency. But I was like, since when is turning off water not a public health emergency? I got their attention. <clears throat> I want to thank U of M, the School for Environment and Sustainability, and the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence governors, and the premiers, getting everybody together for bringing us together today. And the indigenous tribes are such an important part of this. And thanks, you know what? Everybody here cares about our water, and you're dedicated to protecting it. So thanks to all of you. For thousands of years and across generations, no other freshwater system in the world has inspired greater economic prosperity, quality of life, or bi-national unity than the waters of Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. I grew up on the water. I grew up on the St. Clair River. And with many of my residents right now in my district are located along the Detroit River. Protecting the Great Lakes and the diverse species has been personal to me for long before I ever came to Congress. And it's personal to so many in Michigan and this entire region who call it home. I still tell people, heaven to me, okay, you'd kill your child. Young ones, don't do what I'm about to tell you would be going out to the middle of the St. Clair River, getting in the inner tube, floating down, getting in the wake of a freighter, getting on the buoy, waiting for the next one, and getting in the wake of the freighter again. I told you, you shouldn't have done it. 
but there was nothing more peaceful. You'd look at the sky, you looked at the water, you enjoyed all of God's nature and you found tra tranquility. Those waters are important. And at this time last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, marking five decades of partnership between the US and Canada to protect our waters. We also celebrated uh, the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. Before these agreements, our waterways were catching on fire, fish and other species were threatened, and waterfront communities were contaminated with waste. Now, shorelines have been restored and millions of people have a clean drinking water source again. And you know, as you gather here, some of you are seasoned, some of you are young. So, but you can't, I couldn't. I was married to a, a great man. Some of you know him, some of you don't. But he wrote the Clean Water Act. And I was going through the, I, look, I don't, what, that was 50 years ago. I'm seasoned, but not that seasoned. <laughs> and <clears throat> was going through the clips. He was denounced, denounced for introducing the Clean Water Act. He and Ed Muskie, I found Pierce, I found columns across the country. It's gonna to cost too much money. They don't have the right priorities. Can you imagine anybody saying that today? And by the way, shock a shock in these times, it was Richard Nixon who helped support and get it through. Those were different times and days. And while everybody thinks it was the Cleveland River that caught on fire and finally got the work done, it was the Rouge River right here in Michigan that caught on fire and got John Dingle to say, enough is enough, we've got to do something. So unfortunately, Frank, we are getting ahead of this before it is a crisis, but 50 years ago, the pollution of the waters in this country were a crisis and we had to pass the Clean Water Act and it, I was about to swear and I won't, but we gotta, we cannot take for granted the progress that we've made because there are people that want to take that progress back. <clears throat> the, the protections of the Clean Water Act and the Great Lakes Quarter Agreement go hand in hand because we know water doesn't care about borders. And we're here today, it doesn't, by the way. I, when I was young, I didn't know about borders. I'd get on my boat up in St. Clair and go to Canada every day. And I didn't know about checking in in a border patrol. I didn't know Stag Island was Canada. Times have changed. But water for sure doesn't know it. And I'm glad to see Canadi their Canadian partners, some are here. And yes, I've been giving Canada a little hard time the last year, but our you've been coming to the table and helping to invest with us in some of the work that needs to be done. I met recently with a group of Canadian parliamentarians who have been incredible. When you have a partnership, everybody's gotta be part of that partnership. We've all got a role to play. And we're here today to celebrate the progress made possible by the Great Lakes Compact. The compact is a testament to what is possible when we work together bi-nationally and at every level of government to manage these waters responsibly. The compact recognizes that through sustainability, we can foster economic growth and development while supporting those crucial conservation measures. And it recognizes the critical importance of public involvement in the management of our natural resources, incorporating the voices of impacted communities. That is so important. You know, people want to roll back NEPA. Most of you should know what NEPA is. Again, passed 50 years ago, viewed by many as the Magna Carta of environmental laws around the world. Yes, the man that I was married to might have been the author of that at the time too. Um, but it is, I'm looking at it, and I, I, I mean, it was the Magna Carta, and people want to roll back communities having a say. Every community has responsibility and a right to have a say about their natural resources and to have input, and that's why inclusion of the indigenous tribes has become so important as we're having these discussions. 
<clears throat> and while so much progress has been made, we've got to work to continue to protect these waters from those who are seeking to undermine environmental safeguards, especially as we are seeing the growing impacts of the climate crisis. Right now in the Congress, I'm continuing to lead the fight for investments in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And I'm proud that we've secured a billion dollars in the bipartisan infrastructure law. The GLRI is fundamental to protecting, restoring, and maintaining the Great Lakes ecosystem. And I'm gonna continue to work hard to make sure that we continue to dedicate funding. And again, those of you who are seasoned, can remember what our water looked like. When I was in those waters as a kid, they were dirty. And we couldn't eat the fish. There, were, there was mercury. And now we have, you know, we still have work to do on this, by the way. I uh, was at uh, PFAS is, PFAS is, you know, this forever chemical that too many people don't know about. We still don't have a water standard. We've made a lot of progress. Remember, when you come together and you work on an issue and you're a pain in the ass, you can get things done. And we're getting there. But we can't eat fish in this state right now. I, I was at a town hall, and this man in his late 70s, early 80s, got up and is outraged that he can't eat that fish. And, you know, he counts on it. Some people count on our water. And he wanted to know when he was going to be able to. And I didn't have the heart to tell him, probably not in your lifetime but we have a responsibility to keep cleaning up the waters. The fish don't have mercury in them anymore. We've eliminated that. Plants aren't, most plants still have a problem, some places, Liesl's here, she knows, I can be a pain in the bazooka. Um, uh, we have some plants still discharging, but we're on the PFAS mostly. But that's part of the job that we all have, is to protect those waters, to make sure we're cleaning them up and keeping the water safe for future generations. As Congress, we passed the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act, which reauthorizes funding for fiscal years 2022 through 2027 at the same levels at the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration reauthorization of 216, which will fund important programs to conserve the fish and wildlife, combat the threat of invasive species, which is very real in these Great Lakes and protect the Great Lakes for generations. These Great Lakes matter to so many. And you know, we, our compact, is more than 20% of the fresh water in the world. That is a moral responsibility for all of us to protect. We cannot be willy-nilly about it. And quite frankly, our water is going to stay here and protect it. And on those rare occasions that the compact has to let some be diverted, we all got to agree on it. And agreeing together ensures that we are protecting this fresh water source for centuries. That's the responsibility we all have. And it's a responsibility we have binationally and at the federal, state, and local government levels. That's why what you're talking about today is so important. These Great Lakes matter to so many. It's our responsibility to ensure that these massive treasured resources are protected at all times from emerging contaminants, climate change, the invasive species I talked about. Now we have harmful algae blooms and threats to wildlife and their habitats. As I said at the beginning, safe water is essential for families, communities, and businesses to thrive. So your being here, we're a partnership. This is a community of people coming together, taking that job on. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you and my colleagues in the Congress and my parliamentarian friends in Canada to ensure that the fresh water and the Great Lakes watershed is protected for the 100 million in this region who have chosen to work, raise their family, and enjoy the outdoors here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Let's keep this work going on together. Thank you.
Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for your leadership and for your passion, and we really appreciate you being here today. Uh, we're now going to have a series of panel discussions, and uh, we will have opportunity for questions from you in the audience, so please be thinking about your questions to the people who have been involved with the Compact's development and its implementation and thinking about its future. I'd like to invite the moderator for our first session, Peter Annan, to please come forward. Peter is the director of the Mary Griggs Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation at Northland College. Many of you may also know him as the author of Great Lakes Water Wars. Uh, he will introduce his panel and uh, facilitate a discussion with them. And again, please be thinking about your questions so that we can get everyone involved in this important conversation. Peter. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everyone. I'd like all the panelists to come up Again, David starting here, then Kate, Todd, and John. Make sure your mics are on. I think so. There we go. go. Okay, good. So we're going to go down the line, have everyone introduce themselves, what they're doing now, and what their role was in the compact process. David? David Deloney, um, in the compact process, the more important part of it, I was uh, the lead negotiator for Ontario. I was uh, a director and then an assistant deputy minister in natural resources. Uh, after that, I became deputy minister in a couple of different ministries. That's the, the top civil service job in Ontario. And since I left government, I've been doing a number of consulting things. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, I've been uh, the president and chair of the board of a foundation that raises money for First Nations in Northwestern Ontario, Mamoy Wisukatuan Foundation. And I just want to echo, Frank, your comments about, uh, it was a milestone, the, 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 we're going to talk about the compact, everything else, lots of milestones there, but in relations with First Nations in Ontario, very, very important step. And I would say we model a lot of what we do now in government with First Nations on that. So that was a big thing for it. So I thank you for your remarks uh, this morning. And Kate? Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Barter. Um, during the compact, I, was, I went to work for Bob Taft, I think, of a uh, month after he became elected governor in Ohio. And Governor Taft hired me initially to really to be his environment regulatory person. I had been at the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. And really we, in the first year started to, of his term, we started talking about the Great Lakes Charter and it, we t he, he was sort of in the succession line to take over the Council of Great Lakes Governors at the time. And he had this interest. I mean, if you under the Taft family has a long legacy of pl uh, public service in Ohio, and Bob Taft was a was a true uh, conservationist. Uh, well, he still is. I speak like he's not with us anymore. And he this this issue just really piqued his attention. But the reason it the reason we so so we got involved. I was his. Uh, I ended up in his second term being his chief policy advisor where I wasn't just handling environment and things. I was spending all my time on Medicaid and education and things like that. But the Great Lakes, this project consumed more time and energy than anything I did in my almost 20 years of public service. And for Governor Taft, it was equally you know, at times a question of, is this worth the level of investment? Because it was taking a lot of time and effort. So my job was to serve with Sam Speck, who was, who people have mentioned, who was our director of the Department of Natural Resources. And Sam and I were the two negotiators from Ohio throughout this process. And it was Sam who led this effort. We can talk about him more later. But Sam and Bob Taft had a very, very special relationship. And I cannot stress enough the importance of relationship building in doing anything of meaning and how much that meant for this process. So uh, I shut down the Taft administration when um, 
and when, you know, the great thing about these jobs is you kind of know when they're over. And after a period of recovery, I went to work for The Ohio State University. I'm in enemy territory. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I have been at Ohio, I went to Ohio State to help form an interdisciplinary center around energy and the environment because that really, I think working on the compact, working on, I've, I've been working in the, in the environmental arena and I had gotten out of it because the demands of my job were all about Medicaid and education and where the, where the spend really is in government. And I really wanted to go back to that. That's where my heart and soul was. So I've been doing this at Ohio State for about 16 years. I now am the executive director of our Sustainability Institute at Ohio State, and I have an amazing partner, uh, Dr. Alina Irwin, who is a, who's actually the real legitimate academic in this enterprise. But my job at Ohio State is really to manage the budgets, manage the people, do a lot of the external facing relationship building, and to really integrate sustainability in everything we do at Ohio State research, teaching, outreach, and even trying to help make our campus a more sustainable place to, to work. So I, I, I really enjoy this job, but this was an, this experience of working on this is a, was a privilege and it was a once in a lifetime privilege. And I'm not sure I will ever do anything again that created as much meaning in the long term as, as working on the compact. Great, thanks Kate. Todd? Uh, thanks, Peter. I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, Todd Ames, um, at the uh, time I got involved with the compact negotiations was in 2003. Um, I came into uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as the Water Division Administrator under uh, um, newly elected Governor Jim Doyle in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, the Water Division at the time uh, was of fully integrated uh, entity within um, the Wisconsin DNR that we oversaw. I mean, if it, if it had to do with water in Wisconsin, we were uh, regulating it in some way, shape or form. So um, it was, a, it was a, a big effort, a, a, a big job and, and really a, a, an honor to have it. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more later about some of those um, issues, but uh, uh, I went on to the nonprofit sector after that. Um, I had overall spent uh, about 25 years in state government, um, both in Ohio um, and also in Wisconsin, um, and then spent another 20 years working for uh, various nonprofits. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've tried over the years to explain what it is that I did in my career, and my mother, uh, bless her heart, um, who died several years ago. Um, but um, she was never quite sure what I did, but her description, if somebody would ask, you know, what does your son do? And she would just say, he does good things for, for water. And I'm like, that's pretty perfect. Um, so thanks, mom. Uh, I am now uh, retired. Uh, I'm still, um, uh, as my partner would say, I suck at... Um, uh, economics because I left a, a perfectly good paying job as deputy secretary at the Wisconsin DNR. And now I'm on uh, a number of boards and commissions, the Great Lakes Commission. Uh, I'm on the board of the Natural Resources Board for the state of Wisconsin, uh, a couple of other advisory boards. And it, she says, so you're now working basically the same amount as you were before, but you're being paid nothing for it. So good job. Uh, uh, but actually my number one job is dog walker. So, um, but looking forward to the conversation. Great, thanks, uh, John. Hello everybody, it's great to be here with you. Um, especially to our students that are, that, that sort of get some of the richness of this conversation hopefully and put the pieces together. My name is John Allen. Um, I'm at the School for Environment Sustainability here at U of M. Been, been here about four years. Uh, at the time, during the compact negotiations, I was working for a consumer's energy company. I was running their environmental department for a large Fortune 300. And if you heard at all f yesterday from the compact council meeting, the largest water withdrawal sector in the whole entire Great Lakes is the thermoelectric sector. Part of the reason that many of those pie charts are coming down is because we're seeing retirements of coal plants, which is driving 
consumptive use and driving withdrawals out of the system, largely on the back of the retirements and, and some conservation on the other side. So I was on the corporate side. So I came into this process as one of the advisors. Remember, one of the, one of the key aspects of the organization of the compact was not just the state agents and the negotiators negotiating the language, but there was also a series of advisors that would come in periodically and we would advise, right? And that, and that made up of thermoelectric and that was agriculture and that was the water user sector. I, I could go through the whole list of them, but there was a number of advisors, environmental groups, Andy Buxbaum and I spent some time together in those days, <laughs> much to his chagrin, right? <laughs> He's looking at me like, painful. No, it wasn't. It was a joy. It was a joy. It was a joy. And, and it continues to be a joy. So, and then there was a third group. I see my great friend, Jim Nicholas, who was with USGS. There was a, a third group of entities in this conversation. And they were you know, affectionately called observers, but they were largely made up of many of the federal and some of the other state agencies that were both observing the process and providing their expertise. So this isn't just a, a series of bilaterals between the negotiants, but it was an ecosystem of influence and effect. So I came in as an advisor representing the thermoelectric sector in those days. And, um, and, and we kind of went off from there. So I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm currently at U of M um, and I do a bunch of other stuff on water still, but we can save that for another time. Okay, great. So David, let's go back to 1998. Mm -hmm. The NOVA proposal yes. got this all going. Yes. One of the proudest moments in the province of Ontario's entire history, I would say. Well, you know, you know, there's sort of this myth out there that Americans are very entrepreneurial and Canadians not so much. But here we had two guys in their basement who came up with this brilliant idea that they could get a permit from the Ontario government to take a whole bunch of water off of Lake Superior and ship it to China. And, well, they went, they went to the government, they got a permit because the government, I wasn't my department at the time, that's the, you know, I'm fully ready to take blame for just about, you know, but this one wasn't our department. Anyways, the guy, you know, who's doing the permit, he comes in, goes through the checklist, check, 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 meets every test. There's nothing about exports and anything. There's only about diversions, et cetera, et cetera. So it meets all the tests, goes through, they get the permit. And then one of the states, somebody will tell me who it was, says, wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. And that really, I think that's right, it did kick it off. I went to my first meeting in 1999 with so many people in this room uh, that started, uh, we based ourselves on the Great Lakes Charter, um, which had been passed in 1985 or adopted. And we developed what became the annex in 2001. And then that was the sort of the, the overarching principles and everything that then became the agreements and the, uh, and the Great Lakes Compact. So the Nova story, and again, unlike in the States where, you know, now they had a property right with their permit and that would have cost millions of dollars to get back if you wanted to pay them. Like in Canada, we don't have, you know, property rights aren't in the constitution. It's just not quite the same thing. So we went to them and we said, we need the permit back. Well, we want compensation, no. Well, we need something, no. Well, how about write a first refusal if there's ever exports on the Great Lakes? We said, yes, we can do that. You'll get right of right first refusal if we ever have exports. Thank you very much for the permit. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. And then Kate, talk about how the region responded. I mean, it basically freaked out about the NOVA proposal. Well, and I think it freaked out the most probably in the state we're sitting in. Um, I remember there were the with their billboards put up and lots of and you know it was a it was a uh, you know I, I have to go back you know twenty five years here but what what happened is we started looking you know we we were new the governor had was the new chair of the Great Lake Council of Great Lakes Governors 
And we, we did this, we had to do a very deep dive into what did this mean? And then looking into the Water Resources Development Act and really looking at the, the governors of uh, the council, this is pre-David Nafsker actually, um, hired a bunch of lawyers who know a lot about water, many of them from Colorado, as I recall, to kind of give the governors some legal advice about do you have, what kind of, what is your ability to protect this resource. And there was like one line in federal law that said the governors have to agree to any diversion. I mean, it was pretty much, as I recall, that's about it. And that lack, and that was just, the, the, the lawyers were unified in saying, this is never going to hold up in uh, trade law and international treaties. I mean, you, you, you have no standard. How do you make a decision? And that, I think the fact that Bob Taft was a lawyer really was helpful to this because that immediately sort of got his attention, a lack of a standard in law for how do you make decisions. And that began this process of looking at, okay, what could, what could the governors do to main, and the premiers to really maintain to control of, the, of the, the resource, to keep this as a regional decision-making uh, and everyone was sort of united from the very beginning, and this was the thread of the tapestry that really held through this process, was regional, uh, regional control and regional decision making and this fundamental belief that those closer to the water would, would take better care of it, which is a really interesting, you know, in environmental law, how much sometimes we think uh, the opposite, I think, sometimes about we need federal standards and things. Here we had this group of governors and premiers who said, no, we really do want to be controlling our own destiny and this resource. And it, it was a uh, it was a thought really about future generations. And and I think what Frank, you know, the, and it was about protecting the future and understanding they were going to have to make some sacrifices in, in the present to do it. So that kicked off this um, elaborate process of uh, many, many, I mean, at one point we added up the amount of time we spent on this, but, you know, we signed, as David said, I can't remember every step. I mean, I, I could at one time, but it was, it, you know, just three days, I mean, constant meetings in Chicago, bringing all the parties to the table. It was really a, um, it was really important that we bring the whole ecosystem to the table. I like that word you used, John. And we see it when we saw, uh, you know, we had two representatives from every state and uh, Ontario, Quebec, and started this process of trying to figure out how we could, in what kind of standard we really needed to make decisions about using water. And so talk about Sam Speck, oh, his leadership yeah. role, and how he was the right person in the right role in the right time of history yeah, to I've, make history. I have no, there is no doubt in my mind that we wouldn't be here but for Sam Speck. I mean, he, Sam was, um, we were very fortunate. Sam and, and Governor Taft had a long history. They'd served in the Ohio legislature together. Sam had gone on had had an amazing career. He had worked for FEMA at the federal level. He was the president of Muskingum College, which is now Muskingum University in Ohio. And, and he, for, for some very personal reasons, needed to move to a more urban environment. Um, and it was all about his wife who was, who had some degenerative illnesses and needed to be closer to healthcare. And that's what got Sam Speck to agree to be our director of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And my, my job in my first role in working for Bob Tech was to be the person between Sam and the governor. And that was how we, the governor managed. I was the executive assistant for environment and commerce, which really meant I had five agencies who came to talk to me before they, and it was my job to decide what needed to go to the governor, what could we just handle with the chief of staff and others. And Sam, you know, he was just, I, I like to say in my 20 years of government, I learned more from Sam Speck than any other person, including Bob Taft. And I said that to Bob Taft and he's like, you're right. Sam was the best, you know, um, unfortunately. And, and Sam just had the 
diplomatic skills, the smarts, I mean, an incredibly intelligent human being, and really the personality to, to always keep the long game in mind. And he understood that this was about making history and legacy. He also had wonderful staff people like Dick Bartz sitting back there. I've got to give a shout out to Dick who was, Sam brought, you know, a, he had a group of people in his agency who were providing all the technical know-how and the background so that he could, um, he could lead this effort. And he, he his leadership, um, though I, I don't think there's a person in that process who didn't come out of it with great respect for Sam and his, his ability to keep, I mean, he could keep his cool in the worst of, of situations. I remember a couple times I just lost it and I got so mad and I'm not going to say who I was mad at. I don't think anyone's sitting up here with me today, but I was, I would, I would get frustrated by, you know, we would, we would have the same, argument and then we would settle it and then two days later someone else would say you know it would come up again and it was just this start stop go backwards go forwards go backwards go forwards I never ever saw him get for, I mean he he used humor better I mean if you knew Sam had a wicked wicked sense of humor that he was very careful about when it came out and when it didn't but he really was he, he was the only member of our cabinet, and I managed the governor's entire cabinet by the end of the administration, who honestly, if he said to Bob Taft, I think we should do this, the governor agreed, without really challenging it, without pushing back too hard. The governor I worked for was famous for, I have, there are people, staff members who still have PTSD from Bob Taft interrogations on every Monday at 3 p.m. when he would, and you know, that's how he, he was always playing the devil's advocate as governor. But Sam was a special person because he, he really got what he wanted out of Bob Taft. And, but it, I think the governor had such trust in his judgment and his ethics and his commitment to doing good things. And so, and unfortunately, oh, Sam sorry. passed away this year. I should right. say that, which yeah. was a very sad. Um, I was close to him to the day he died, and you know, we really lost. We really lost a great statesman in losing Sam. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, Todd, journalists like me were trying to find out what was going on behind the curtain uh, throughout all those years of the compact process. Can you take us? behind the curtain, what was it like in the room and were people throwing things at each other and all of that? I mean, to really take us in the room and what was it like? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Of course, I never said anything to you behind the curtain, so i just make that clear. Uh, um, well, I, yeah, I will touch on that. I, I do wanna kind of set the stage a little bit and I was thinking about this uh, this morning um, and uh, Kate's already mentioned, um, and particularly for students in the room embarking on a career, you know, it really is about relationships and it's about um, people being um, smart enough to know kind of the, the key things and when to make a difference in such a big effort as this. And um, I, I want to give a shout out to really the reason I'm sitting here now and had uh, played such a role um, and privileged to play such a role in this at the time. Um, uh, is Bruce Baker, who's here. Um, and um, so, and Bruce was smart enough, he was the deputy in the water division. So I come in in 2003 with Governor Doyle. And there were like 3,000 employees at the DNR at the time, and there were seven of us that served at the pleasure of the governor. I had known Jim Doyle since 1990. I worked as his senior policy analyst and. Attorney General's office. So think about this in the context of what we were doing. Uh, we we're early on in the negotiations, but Bruce was smart enough to realize if we're gonna get to the end point here, the governors and the premiers have to agree to this. The only way the governors are going to agree is you've gotta have key people that know the governor to convince them to do this. It's not that hard in Michigan. I mean, if, if you don't pay attention to the Great Lakes in Michigan and you're an elected official, 
your problem. Um, in other states, it's not necessarily the top level issue, particularly for a governor. And for me, as a new water division administrator, I'm looking at all of these issues and all of this stuff, and I've got 700 employees, and it was just overwhelming to me. And I remember, Bruce, we go to lunch. I'm on board maybe six weeks. And he's talking to me about this thing and about this charter and this stuff that's happening. And I'm like, oh my God, this sounds really complicated. And how in the world am I gonna find time to pay attention to this? And how he caught my attention was he said to me, at one point he said, you need to be involved in this. And you need to be the person who is the li liaison to the governor's office. Because if we succeed, if we get this done, it will be the single most important thing you do in this job. OK, I'm in. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and so uh, what was it? Over 100 in-person day-long and evening meetings, 400 conference calls, 92 drafts. Uh, I, I, I still have. We were on a conference call. I'm sitting in the governor's office with Pat Henderson on the phone. He was the governor's point person for this, where we spent three hours, three hours discussing whether it should be a semicolon or a colon on page 80 of the draft. I'm like, kill me now. <laughs> uh, but that was the effort that we needed to have. And all of the in-person meetings that we had, uh, which began at the Drake Hotel on the shores of Lake Michigan in downtown Chicago, this beautiful old ornate hotel, if you haven't been there. We then went to Oak Brook, Illinois. And then we ended at a basement windowless conference room at a, I don't know, it was like a Motel 6 in Skokie. <laughs> Our progress was uh, directly, inversely related to the quality of our accommodations. <laughs> we didn't get very far at the Drake. By the time we got to Skokie, it's like, oh my God, get this done. So, um, but anyway, it was, uh, it, it was a, an amazing effort, an incredible undertaking, really taught me uh, a lot. Uh, that I took with me for my whole career. But it's about, I mean, fundamentally, um, what it reminds you is, first off, you know, it's the old adage, which is really true, if it was easy, somebody would have already done it. Um, but the other one for this was that to recognize, and, and again, for those starting out in your career, you will, you will have these points in time where you have to make a decision. Are you all in or not? And you can't do that on every issue that you are doing. This was one where we had a rather significant critical mass of people that ultimately made the decision, we are all in, we're gonna figure out how to make this happen. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna take a hell of a long time and a lot of work, but we'll get there. Great, thanks Todd. So John, from talk about the stakeholder role in this whole thing and then what was the key moment that you remember from the process and we're getting a little bit short of time so try and keep it brief wow how did we distill all this down to a key moment um the stakeholder process for us was was pretty critical if you're an advisor if you're an observer if you're a participant in a process you have to you're, you're no longer just an advocate for your own position you have to see the bigger context. And I, I, I'd argue that the advisory groups and, this, and the other groups that came into this took that seriously. It wasn't just every time we showed up, we espoused our own position. We started to think about this holistically, about the thing we were trying to solve. I remember early on, a Andy and I were invited, Sam and, and the group invited us in, and, and Andy and I were there, and you, you and I spoke, and I think we shocked the group, quite frankly, because we said roughly the same thing. So here's a guy from industry and here's a guy from the NWF. And we, we said, here's, we shared the same vision for the type of system that we wanted to see. Not all the details of it, but I think we tried to give advice that mattered, right? So, and I think as you saw advisors come and as you saw 
folks participate, you started to see a coalescence around certain ideas. When, when we thought, there were moments when we thought and some of the advisors thought that the Compact Council might have been stuck on a comma or a semicolon or, you know, once in a while we would jump in with some advice, some thoughts about how we would solve it. Doesn't mean they had to take it, but as an advisor, that's your obligation as an advisor to advise, not just to advocate. And if you take that role seriously, you have to start to, you have to, start to think about it relative to the thing you're trying to solve. So I, I, think, I think that's the case. Um, I, uh, relationships matter, process matters, stage setting matters, how the process was designed from the beginning mattered. It didn't just happen. People didn't just show up. The endless amount of thinking around a process that was going to bear fruit mattered. This notion that we were moving from a categorical federal ban on diversions, right, in, in federal law that had no standard that was not justifiable or, or demonstrable, that could have been challenged under arbitrary and capricious standards, to a set of standards that says, here's how we're gonna evaluate that. And to me, the real, the real live piece of this was, it's a conservation-based standard. It's not a standard based on whether we liked the entity that was taking with water or not, whether it was power, whether it was bottled water, it didn't matter. The standard was around the protection of natural resources. It was giving natural resource a right to exist in a state. No loss, no harm to water and water dependent natural resources. So once you start to get to that level of standard, that's epiphanal, right? Things start to rally around this notion that it's not about this use or that use. Nature doesn't care what that use is for. What cares is whether you're looking at nature in its state and whether you're looking to protect water and water dependent natural resources. We were then able to amplify that, take that into state law and really build, build that. And the other part I will say, the other piece of this that was so important is really understanding the subtle difference between sort of regulatory certainty, because many people came out of a regulatory environment, they saw it as a regulatory problem to solve. And many of us in the stakeholder community and at the, at the, at the integration community, if you will, saw this, that we needed flexibility in eight states that were all very different and two provinces. If it was too prescriptive, it was gonna be impossible to pass at the state level. So you can't think about this only as a problem to solve in ecological or environmental space. Every step of the way you have to think about this strategically, culturally, in political space. The best policy in the world is nothing if you can't get it passed, right? And, and we worked endlessly hard on making that happen. And I think part of the stakeholder community, the advisory community, was, was always trying to bring that check in of what we thought we could get passed. We're about to get to a quick Q&A. If there's microphones up in the balcony, if people want to line up at a microphone with a question. But key moments, run out of time, David. What's the key, single key moment you remember? Kate, Todd, going to ask the same thing. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it could be a long conversation, but uh, well, I'll, I'll keep it short. The key moment for us, as, as John is saying, we were developing this conservation-based standard. Um, but in Ontario and in Canada, in reaction to the NOVA proposal, we had a ban on bulk water uh, removals, out and out ban. And so, you know, we didn't have the Commerce Clause issue. We didn't, not to get too nerdy here, but we didn't have a number of the issues that the states had. So we agreed those negotiators, you know, people weren't just, just weren't going to go to a ban. So we said, fine, we'll work with that, we'll work with that. We took it back, we dotted a lot of I's, crossed a lot of T's, spent a lot of hours doing it. We took it back, we went to public meeting, many, many of the negotiators and that were there in Toronto. We got the, nobody's sworn yet, so I won't. We got the poop kicked out of us, like kicked out of us. Sam and I were up at the front, you know, those pictures that you saw last night for those of you who were at dinner making our point, this point, that point, and the other thing. No, 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 no. What don't you get? We don't want to see water going out of the basin. So we came back and, you know, kind of redid the whole thing on the premise of that we would be ba banning diversion. Instead of allowing diversions under strict criteria, we would be banning diversions with exceptions that had criteria. So I think in the end, it sort of met this you know, met the American concerns, the state concerns and that. 
So that's both the low moment and then the high moment that emerged out of that uh, for me and for Ontario. Yeah, probably the single most intense public hearing of the entire compact process. So, Kate. I mean, the, the moment that was really this joyful moment was when we were in Milwaukee signing the 10 party agreement. And I, I was so moved by the pageantry and really I was personally, it was a life changing moment for me to listen to the perspective of the First Nations and that the eloquence and the poetry of water and the importance that, as Frank said, it's not a, you know, it's something we live with. And that, that I mean, we had, did, I think we had all the governors and all the, and the premiers and, you know, the, it was such a, a it, that was the moment, you know, you have these moments in your life that you'll never forget, like where you were standing on 9-11. That's a moment that for me, I was, it made all this work and all this effort and all this time I had spent away from a new, you know, I had a baby at the beginning of this. Um, it just made it, it made it so magical, that moment. That's what I'll share. Todd? Uh, well, David and Kate have already hit on two of the key moments uh, uh, for me. So, um, uh, but to, you know, it, it's, it, I still to this day, just as, as, a, as a quick aside, believe that the uh, the original version of the compact, uh, what was proposed, which was that um, you could take any water that you wanted out of the basin as long as you returned it all. And that was it. I still think that is a stronger standard than what we have. But having said that, we could have a whole other panel just to talk about that. Um, but... The, <laughs> But it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to, you know, we weren't going to be able to get there. We're trying to wrap, Todd. No yeah. time for a bombshell. <laughs> so my point is, as we're so, but it's a lead in to David's point. How do we then get, how do we get this thing, this ban with exceptions? And for me, it was, um, I'm on my way to go camping and I am sitting in a parking lot in the middle of nowhere in northern Wisconsin for two hours on the phone with Andy Buxbaum and George Cooper. And George, who's unable to be here, still around thankfully, but who um, was speaking on behalf of, of key industries across the Great Lakes Basin, and Andy, obviously a key NGO. And we were, I don't remember exactly the, the specific piece, but the point was that we were talking about how do we come up with language for this concept that is going to pass muster, not only with folks at the table like myself, but with the key constituencies and having Andy and George on the phone talking with me about how do we get there was the sign that just the fact that they were on the phone with me was indicative of, okay, we're going to figure out, this is going to, this is, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So that was a key point for me. Great. Well, obviously we could keep going. Dave's giving me signals to wrap things up, but will you please join me in thanking our panelists here today? Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone who was on our first panel. So that all takes us to 2005. The compact negotiation process has been completed. The agreement has been signed. We've gone to Milwaukee. We've taken pictures. We've had the pageantry and we're celebrating. And then we then had to go to the next stage, which was eight state legislatures, Congress, the process in Ontario and Quebec, uh, and all of that, uh, which was as difficult or more perhaps than just the negotiation, which you've learned about and how difficult that was. So we've got, uh, I think, absolutely the right person to facilitate our next conversation, Andy Buxbaum, who's a lecturer here at the university in the School of Law, and at the time was the director of the National Wildlife Federation Great Lakes Center, uh, and a real key part of the advisory committee uh, and a collaborator with all of us. So Andy, I invite you to the stage and you'll introduce our panelists. Please uh, join me in welcoming Andy Buxbaum. Like I really need a microphone. Okay. Um, 
so let's let's do the let's get to the introductions right away. Um, there's no clock in here, so are you going to signal? All right, I'm, I'm going to pull out, I'm gonna pull out this too. The next panelist, uh, make sure that uh, if you see this here, uh, it's mine. Okay, Molly, go ahead. Hi, everybody. It's uh, very fun to be here with all of you. Uh, it's great to see folks yesterday. Uh, I currently work at the Alliance for the Great Lakes, uh, a nonprofit working to protect and restore the Great Lakes. But during the period of time uh, when we were working to get the compact passed in the state legislatures, I worked for Andy uh, at the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and I don't want to go too long, but part, part of that process was really working uh, with environmental organizations across the Great Lakes region, both in the United States and Canada. Um, and I'll save any more for the conversation. Hey. Uh, I'm Pete Johnson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. Uh, back during this process, I was the Deputy Director of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. <laughs> I've been doing this for about 25 years now. Uh, so I was actually around when the Nova Group incident happened and uh, in the beginning of the process and all that. But um, I, I now provide the primary staff support to the regional body and the Compact Council um, now that they are realities. So. Shaylee. Hi, I'm Shaylee Pfeiffer, and I work at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, I started there in 2004 in the Office of Great Lakes uh, and then moved to the uh, water use program at the DNR um, and have been involved with the compact for my whole career at the DNR, um, specifically more recently working on the Waukesha diversion application. Great, thank you all. Um, we are some great speakers this morning and a phenomenal panel just now um, in this emphasis on water is life. It can't, it can't get any more basic than that, um, except one, one thing, which is it's not just water, it's the Great Lakes. Um, the Great Lakes are our home. The uh, Great Lakes are our identity. Um, those of us in Michigan feel it every day, um, all the time. And that's why the compact and this discussion is one of the reasons that people talk about it as the highlight of what they've done, the most important thing they've done, because it's not just protecting the water, it's protecting our home. And that's, that's, there's nothing that compares to that. And so it's great that you've, we have so many students here um, who can take up the baton and carry it forward. Um, but to do that, we not only need to know the history of what happened, but also how it got implemented. Um, what actually happened? You, 2005, we had this phenomenal gathering in Milwaukee where all you know the governors come and the stakeholders come and everybody is thrilled. They sign a piece of paper saying, this is what we want to do. That piece of paper had no effect of law. It made no difference. And we're talking about that piece of paper having a major, major change. It changed, would have changed every one of the eight Great Lakes states and two provincial um, water laws. Um, it would have, for the first time, knitted together groundwater and surface water the way they're regulated. And it had this new standard for not just diversions, but for in-basin withdrawals. Every major withdrawal was going to have to go through the same standard, and every state was going to have to adopt that same standard. And every state had all these different geopolitical interests, but they also had all these different stakeholder interests because different industries, um, different recreational interests, uh, different, um, different tribal interests, everything was different in every state. And yet we're supposed to all do the same thing. So Pete, what do we do? Um, so, you know, it, it was a little daunting and yes, you get this piece of paper. Great. We've, we've got agreements. We've got the governors endorsing the compact. We've got, uh, the governors and premiers all signing this agreement, but to actually make this happen, it has to, as, as Dave referenced, and as you referenced, it had to go through 16 legislative chambers, two chambers in each of the eight states and get the uh, consent of both the, the house and the Senate at the federal level and signed by the president. So, um, you know, the story does not begin, though, on, in 2005 when it was signed. It started long before then. And, you know, as, as John was talking about the ecosystem uh, of, of the Great Lakes region here, and it's not just the states and the provinces, it's the stakeholders, it's the tribes, it's the First Nations. And I think, you know, again, going back, one of the best moves that we made was to bring the advisors and make sure that we had everybody around the table. And when we were talking 
when, when we brought our advisors in, um, we, we made sure that they were mostly national organizations or big regional organizations like the NWF Great Lakes office and said, part of your role is to ensure that the other more localized stakeholders are generally aware of what's going on and get their feedback. And so we had this ongoing back and forth. Also, you know, those discussions going on between um, the various advisors like, like Todd was describing, you know, it, it allowed the advisors, these various representatives to understand the issues that, and the perspectives of each other and understand the compromises that needed to be made. You know, and, and I think Kate referenced this as well, is that this idea that we, there was this common, common goal and driver that we wanted to keep authority within the region. Um, and, and everybody agreed on that. We found what everybody could agree on. You know, we did not, and, and I use this phrase a lot when we were talking to legislators later on, we don't want the courts or Congress taking over this. Everybody agreed. Yeah, 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 that's right. So that when, and, and we, we also did a lot of prep work, bef you know, during these negotiations, we would go to uh, the Great Lakes Task Force in Washington, D.C. Um, they would help organize meetings. We'd brief staff just so that they knew what was going on. This was on the horizon that uh, we were having these discussions. There was a Great Lakes Legislative Caucus that would, had been formed a few years beforehand. Some key uh, senators, uh, State Senator Patty Burkholz, in particular from Michigan, um, who brought together legislators from across the region to um, talk and share information with each other, but we also were invited regularly to come and provide updates and let them know what was going on. So, this, so that when we finally had basically this piece of legislation, and I should note, and this was alluded to, it had to be the exact same piece of legislation passed through all these chambers. They could not make a single change to the legislation itself. They could make some changes on how it was implemented within each of the jurisdictions, but the legislation itself could not be changed, and that's not natural for legislators to deal with. Um, and we, I mean, part of the education we also had to do was explaining this, because there's, you know, there's not as the, the same history of compacts necessarily in the Great Lakes region. So um, when we finally uh, had the legislation through groups like the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus and these folks who were aware of what was going on. Um, we had our champions. I mean, the bills don't introduce themselves. And as much as, you know, like a governor or we may say, hey, this is a great thing, somebody's got to get out there and actually introduce the bill and be a champion to push it within their legislature. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, and the same thing at the federal level, the staff people were aware of what was going on so that when we, we got there, um, you know, it was uh, fighting hard to be, frankly, a sponsor at that point. When we went to the various legislatures, when it finally got up uh, uh, for consideration and some hearings and whatnot, I can still remember uh, in Indiana, it was actually, there was uh, uh, some hearings and we had um, somebody from one of the environmental organizations, I think it was the Sierra Club, came up and said, this is a fantastic thing, man, you've got to pass this. And we had folks from industry come up and uh, 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 testify. They said, this is a fantastic thing. You, you got to pass this. And I still remember the state senator, a uh, Republican, um, uh, uh, who was the chair of this, said, I don't think I've ever heard, uh, had a hearing like this where everybody agreed and said, we need to do this. Um, we had some challenges in other uh, jurisdictions, but there was... Um, uh, you know, there was some momentum that was being built and, it, you know, this whole story of the region is behind us because of all this work that, you know, these folks had done, including our stakeholders, including the states and the provincial negotiators to say there is momentum behind this. You want to be on the right side of this at the end of the day. So um, and then after that, and we can talk a little bit about this and Shale in particular is. Okay, so once you got this, what do you actually do to implement these things? You know, okay, now we've got a law. How do you actually make it work? Yeah, you know, so it, it was. It's been fun throughout. That's why I've been here for twenty five years. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Pete. And a call out to Kay. Thanks for that Indiana piece, huh? Um, Molly. So um, we got the overview from Pete of what has to, what had to happen. You know, the various chunks. We know that this doesn't work like a civics lesson, right? So. You were on the ground in many of those states. Um, 
what happened? How did how did it actually go from being introduced to get the political will to actually get it passed in every state? A lot of people pulling in the same direction. Um, so the Mott Foundation had some great foresight in terms of, a, a, of organizing environmental organizations in that they funded National Wildlife Federation, Great Lakes United, a number of large regional organizations, and then also funded at least one state organization, uh, environmental organization in each state. And so that was the state lead. Um, and I actually began my career uh, at the Ohio Environmental Council working on this issue. And OEC was the state lead, uh, which is how I got to know Sam Speck and Kate Barter and many others. Um, and then 2005, moved to the National Wildlife Federation and had the opportunity to work with state organizations across the basin trying to get this, this thing, this very important thing passed. Uh, and a little bit of behind the curtain information is that we didn't all agree with each other. Uh, <laughs> it was it's not easy. Like there were there were definitely stakeholders like National Wildlife Federation really you know pushing to get this passed as quickly as possible. But then there were other organizations that were like, oh wait a minute, like yeah yeah we definitely want to pass this, but this is our opportunity to get something done on water resource use in our state. Um, and so, you know, that was that was like a hard thing to work through. We'd already negotiated this compact, and now, simul like, sort of simultaneously to passing the compact, we were negotiating state legislation, and organizations, stakeholders of all kinds, were like, "Yeah, we're not we're not moving this compact until we figure out the state piece of it." That didn't happen everywhere, but it happened in a lot of places, and so. I traveled around to all the Great Lakes states. I've been to every uh, state house working on this, except Illinois, uh, because Mayor Daley told me, don't worry about it. They, they had this, um, and they did. Uh, and, um, you know, really, I'll, I'll use two examples. Uh, I was fortunate to live and work in the state of Michigan. And in Michigan, Senator Patty Burkholz, who was a champion of the Great Lakes that I think we all miss very much, um, organized stakeholders in the state of Michigan to talk about how the state would govern water use because Michigan's essentially all in the Great Lakes Basin. And so a lot of its responsibility is using Great Lakes water wisely within the state. And so she led negotiations among stakeholders similar to uh, the Compact Advisory Board, all of the different uh, water users and folks working to protect water uh, and negotiated some really protective uh, and I would say, you know, leading um, regulations on water use um, and ensuring that water that gets used in the state of Michigan doesn't cause harm to the resource. Um, and so, you know, that got done. It got done because of the work of a lot of people in this room. Um, and then uh, another example is Ohio. Ohio was really interesting because you had the leaders of this of this whole thing um, pushing to get this legislation done, and then you had one legislator uh, who <laughs> who didn't want to get it done um, and was really holding things up for different issues entirely. He had uh, coastal property owners that were really concerned about private property rights. And somehow he like twisted this compact issue into like taking away more, more people's rights, which of course wasn't true, but you know, did have traction. And so, you know, did a ton of work again with like stakeholders, all different kinds. And this is something that I would, uh, I guess I would say to um, students in the room is like, it is true. You have no permanent friends and you have no permanent enemies. You really do need to figure out how you can find common cause with organizations you don't agree with all the time, because that's really powerful in getting this work done. And in Ohio, that was a big part of, of getting this done. Um, there were Republicans, there were Democrats, there was the Chamber of Commerce and the manufacturers and the farmers and the environmental organizations all saying, no, we have to get this done. And um, obviously, 
the state itself, Governor Taft, Sam Speck, really pushing to get this done. And so ultimately, uh, Ohio got it done. Um, and, and a similar sort of situation played out in all the states in terms of negotiating and pushing. And ultimately, 95% of state legislators voted in favor of the compact. I don't know who those 5% were. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're on the wrong side of history. Um, but yeah, I will say that um, having the opportunity to work on getting the compact passed in the states and working with so many of you in this auditorium and so many people who weren't able to be here today was truly, I think, the honor and pleasure of my career. I say I peaked early. <laughs> I, start, I started my career working on this issue, and then the compact became law, and then I still had a lot of work to do, uh, and hopefully still have a long career ahead of me, but, but truly uh, thank you all for, for the work that each of you put into making this a reality. Andy, if I could just play Perfect. off a little bit there. Just one thing that I should have also noted was just the importance of the political buy-in of the top political leaders as well, too. Um, so, you know, talking about the Ohio, um, what finally got it through uh, was an agreement to actually put on the, um, the, the November election a constitutional amendment to Ohio. There was an agreement made. I mean, it was so important to um, uh, the various groups that you've talked about and the governor, and they worked it out. So, okay, to address your issue, we're going to put on the ballot a constitutional amendment, and that's what got it done. And at the end of the day, you say no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. This person we were talking about was at the on the stage during the signing ceremony, you know, and we knew that was going to be important. And I also know when we went to D.C., uh, Governor Doyle, as mentioned, was the chair at that point. He spent three days with us doing compact stuff only meeting with the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader, the relevant chairs of the committees, pointing out how important this was to the region. I mean, having the governor himself, and this was all he did uh, for that three-day three period, and um, that spoke volumes. You, you have to have that leadership buy-in for something like this. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Um, before, uh, Shaley, before I ask you a question, just I wanted to kind of reach back to something that both of you have said and that John Allen said, too. Um, and that is the importance of the stakeholder process. There are essentially two different negotiations going on at the same time early on. There was the, between the parties, actually, and then there were between the stakeholders. And normally, in a situation like that, the parties just run it and the stakeholders provide advice um, and occasional input, and sometimes it's taken and sometimes it's not. Because of Sam Speck and because of the way he set this up and because of the, um, of, of the permission of the folks who were You've, you've seen today, um, the stakeholders actually had a major role. And particularly if you're students, um, you're going to be involved in a lot of stakeholder processes as you go forward, sometimes as a decision maker, oftentimes as advisors or whatever. And it's important to know when it's going to make a difference. This was the most consequential stakeholder negotiation I've ever been part of. And, um, and because what we came up with was really listened to. And it wasn't just at the end, although that was huge, um, negotiating with John and being on the phone with, with, with Todd and George and others. Um, there were some phenomenal people all the way along. And on the, and on the environmental side, you had, you had Reg Gilbert from Great Lakes United, Noah Hall. I mean, you were just, John, you were showing me this, um, this, this document you still have from 2004, where Noah began to frame out how this whole thing would look, um, and something which, the, which the, the, the governments then took up. Um, uh, Cam Davis, um, there were some real major players here who then have gone on to do other things. And of course, then there's Molly Flanagan, who's now known as, as the invasive carps person. So, you know, <laughs> uh, so, um, so as you're, as you're looking forward as, and you get started in, in this, uh, advocacy space uh, as students, um, knowing when you're going to make a difference and it, you know, not knowing at the beginning, but sticking to it and finding your place to make a difference, even as a non-government actor, can be hugely important. So, but back to the implementation. Um, so, Shaley, we've got this thing passes. Congress passes it in weeks. It's just unbelievable. They don't do anything in weeks, and we can get back into that in a second. You now have a program in Wisconsin. No, you have a law in Wisconsin. There's no program in Wisconsin. How do you make a program? 
Um, well, we had been promised by Todd Ames it would take 10 years for it to get through Congress. And there was a quick kind of last minute, oh, we might gonna have this interim period in the legislation. So what are we gonna do in the interim period? That was gonna give us time to get a lot of these programs all set up. We had six months. Um, <laughs> and that was a real flurry. Uh, but I will just first go back just a little bit, some other comments people have made. The first time I heard about uh, Annex 2001, I had that similar reaction. I heard somebody else say, this is really complicated. I don't think I want to be involved with this. <laughs> and I've then gone on to have an entire career that's about pulling out the compact and saying, what does it say in here? How did they address this? So I, I just always kind of come back to that moment and reference that for students that things that look really complicated may be the most interesting thing you have the opportunity to work on. Um, and so, yeah, it's a flurry of activity. You have these new laws. You have um, this process. DNR decided to put together a new section, so a water use section, move it out of this office of Great Lakes, put it in a place where there was implementation, you know, organizing different programs. We ended up with the high-capacity well approval program that's also in with um, the compact implementation program because so... So much of the water management side in Wisconsin relates to uh, reviewing these groundwater approvals. Um, and so, yeah, it was that flurry of activity. There's grandfather diversion approvals that you needed to issue. There's water use permits that needed to get put together. Everybody who had a water withdrawal in the state needed to be issued a water use. Water registration, water re reporting programs, all of those pieces that are really the backbone of the compact. So there's so much attention that gets put on that diversion component, which I think, you know, certainly the driver um, and the, fl the flashy aspect, but that's where I admire, you know, all those brains that came into putting the compact together because it's not just about the diversions, it's the whole backbone that says, how are you gonna manage water in a basin, um, you know, from Duluth, to Toronto, and what do you need to do to set up these parallel programs all across the region to do that? Um, and so having our implementing legislation from the beginning was huge. Having there be a, a budget bill to provide some funding for those programs was also huge. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we've done, is that we've moved beyond the, let's get every water user re registered, let's get um, all of that, you know, the programming set up for there to be water use reporting. And now we get to be at a point where we can apply for USGS grants to figure out how do we refine the data that we're getting? How do we use it for more purposes? You know, we, we put it, package it together every year, send it to the Great Lakes Commission for their annual report. But we want to be able to do more with that for being able to inform um, water use policy at the county level and at the watershed level. And that requires, you know, a greater refinement of what the quality of those data are um, for the backbone of that. So you know what I'm going to follow up with, right? Um, the, um, one of the driving forces behind all the negotiations over the compact from all the different states, is, as far as I could tell, was the prospect that Waukesha, um, a, a straddling county, uh, but not a straddling community, was going to be, and we didn't have those concepts initially, that was going to be asking um, for a diversion, a near basin diversion. And I think that affected the negotiations dramatically from what I could tell from, well, from what Todd told me from behind the curtain. I'm sorry, what I learned from behind the curtain. Uh, but, um, but you had to hit the ground running and then Waukesha's application, I mean, it came in. How did you, how did you manage that? So here's again a shout out to Todd Ames, to Bruce Baker um, is in the room. Chuck Ledeen isn't here today, but he was my first boss at the DNR and just a, a really incredible person to work with. I learned so much um, from all three of them. And so that's, you know, that's sort of the hit the ground running. It's, it's again, the compact laid out the structure. Compact gets passed. The um, conference Great Lakes Governors and Premiers didn't stop there. They said, okay, we need to have guidance on how we're going to implement this, um, you know, specifically with the prospect of that uh, Waukesha diversion application coming in. We need to have a timeline and a process. We need things to be just ironed out step by step so that when this application comes at the state level and then to the regional level, we're prepared 
and there's not really an opportunity for it to get, get stalled, that there's gonna be decisions. And I'm sure that, that Pete can talk more about kind of the thinking behind all that. But we had the template, you know, somebody mentioned that whole standards, John, I think it was, who mentioned it's, it's a standards um, that comes in of what do you have to meet for those criteria. And so our job was to put a technical review together that looked at every single one of those standards. And we used as much as possible existing programs within the, within the agency. So not trying to create new ways to evaluate um, you know, different criteria like reasonable water supply alternative. We were looking at it in terms of public health impacts, environmental impacts, um, you know, significant or similar in cost to, trying to use concepts that had already been developed so that there was, you know, some other basis for that decision-making process and background. Um, and I'll just say one of the things that I love about working at the Department of Natural Resources is that if you have a question, there is somebody in the agency who has spent a career trying to understand it and, and knowing those solutions. So I felt like so much of my job in that process was finding the right people to help me understand, you know, how do we need to approach and answer this question? Um, Did you have other things that you wanted to add to the Waukesha process from the council standpoint? Well, I, I guess I would just say, you know, again, that's one where um, people having been involved in the discussions, you know, it, as you say, Waukesha was, I'm not sure I'd necessarily call it the driver, but it was definitely in the back of the mind. People were aware of that. And um, it was something that we needed to be prepared for. After the compact did become law, and even, you know, before that, we started thinking about, okay, what kind of process, what do we need to be dealing with here? Um, a lot of the work right after the, okay, we've got this law passed, how do we organize ourselves? How do we do budgets? How do we do resolutions? How do we do, um, what, what do we need to set up? Well, we probably need to do some guidance at the very least, eventually some rulemaking. Um, we are going to have to figure out some procedures. We're going to have to, there's no precedence for us at least, you know, there's, there's nothing there. And we did spend a lot of time talking to other interstate compact agencies and uh, learning from them, but they took very different approaches in their laws than we did. So they were informative, but to a point. Um, but uh, it, we had a lot of discussions, you know, it doesn't end. And so um, it's the next stage. Again, makes it kind of fun and interesting. It's the, the uh, you know, when, when you're starting something brand new, it's, it was a great opportunity to set up the procedures. So yeah, we set up guidance, we set up procedures, we had a lot of discussions amongst ourselves. We had discussions with our advisory committee and just made sure that, okay, when this thing comes down, we understand what each step is going to be. And we're all on the same page and we have clear guidance and clear procedures for everybody out there. So that when the application finally did come, we knew what step one was gonna be. We knew what step two, we knew the timelines, we knew where we were gonna go. And at the end of it, um, there were some disagreements from some of the folks on the final outcome, um, but I think there was general consensus of this was handled right. The procedure actually went the way it was supposed to go. It went the way the drafters envisioned this was going to work. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so very happy with how that worked out. Yeah. The two of you make it sound so easy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Todd, how many scars do you have from that process? Um, so just for students that, that weren't familiar with this, it took years, many years for that process to play out. The Waukesha proposal went up, it went down, it went up, it went down. Um, the DNR and the Compact Council did their thing. My, do you remember, you were at the Joyce Foundation, but do you remember, do you, do you remember what happened here? Yeah. Ta talk to us about it. Yeah, so when I was actually, uh, I guess during the period of like public hearings on the Waukesha Diversion, I was at the Alliance for the Great Lakes working really closely with Mark Smith at the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and this was an example of something where public comment was really important. So stakeholder engagement was important, but, but the state of Wisconsin, to, to Wisconsin's credit, uh, really committed to public comment and to getting comments across the Great Lakes Basin and you got a lot of comments. Uh, um, and so again, environmental organizations were organizing 
other organizations, but also reaching out to their members about the importance of this issue and the importance of, of getting involved. And so I'll admit I've been to a lot of public meetings and sometimes you don't get a lot of like real people. You get a, lo you get a lot of stakeholders who come and say what you expect them to, to say. Um, but in this process, you actually had a lot of real people, a lot of, of citizens, a lot of residents of Waukesha, a lot of residents of the state of Wisconsin, also a lot of residents in, in other states that really cared about this and were talking to their state about what, what they wanted their state to do when it came time to vote on this. Um, and so it was an example of the public really turning out and then really, I think, having an impact on the process because there were things that there were there were things we didn't get for sure but there were things that we did get you know we pushed for uh, a smaller diversion area for Waukesha we pushed for less less water uh, in the diversion and those are things that the compact council heard and ended up when they did approve Waukesha putting conditions um, on Waukesha for what they had to do if they wanted to implement that diversion. And Andy, you said a long process. I think, was it 2009 when Waukesha put in its application, initial application? Yeah, 2010, and then it was under state review through 2015, and then we forwarded it to the Compact Council and Regional Body in January of 2016. And then it, it finally started, the diversion, just, just this fall. Uh, so it's been it's been a really really long process, and um, just thinking about the compact, you know, Illinois had its Illinois diversion that was like sacrosanct when they were negotiating the compact, and I would say like Wisconsin had Waukesha. Uh, there's a reason, you know, that there's a, an exception for communities within straddling counties, um, and I think you know there were. There's Waukesha, I think there are other communities in, in Wisconsin that, that might be interested in this water that, that maybe are similarly located. Yes, similarly located. Similarly located. And the precedent um, that Waukesha set is, uh, I think one of the learnings is, it took over 10 years and how many millions of dollars for a small community to be able to get this. So if it, it, this truly is an exceptional case and ex exceptional circumstances that would allow a diversion within a, with a county. So good work to the negotiators to make sure that that was, that I think that's what you intended. Um, so it, to be fair, I wouldn't say necessarily intended that <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive or whatnot, but that it would be thorough and it would be open. Uh, the, the process would be thorough. It would be open. It would be, um, thoughtful and you know you, you, having been around the table not as one of the decision makers but you know staffing all this the thing that really impressed me was how seriously the, the members of the regional body and the compact council most of whom were not around the table during the negotiations at this point this was quite a while afterwards but uh, you know the, the new folks took this legacy this legislation that had been developed and adopted made it their own and took it seriously and looked very closely at the application. Yeah, Grant and, and, and Grant Trigger here, um, you know, played a major role in that. And, um, uh, and Jim Zeringer from Ohio, who was the chair of the uh, Regional Body Compact Council through the Waukesha proposal, how seriously they took that. And, you know, there were a lot of folks in here who came to the regional body meetings. We, we had these discussions at uh, the University of Illinois Chicago in these conference or amphitheaters really and anybody could, could come in and and they were you know debating and negotiating and I mean we've got reams of transcripts if anybody ever actually wants to read it um, <laughs> but it was out in the open uh, what what the considerations were and you know you talk about you know the advocacy effort and it was important to hear the public comments but at the end of the day it was the standard that drove things. And it was whether it met the standards that were agreed to or not. It was the law that was driving it. It was not, it was not politics. It was not, um, you know, it's what you are supposed to have happen. Bailey, do you agree? I think it's really important that Jim Zeringer get acknowledged as being the chair. Um, he really set the tone for kind of a group working together in a very collegial fashion, um, which was really conducive to 
you know, getting difficult issues addressed. And I also think it's really important to acknowledge Grant Trigger, who had a tremendous impact on the whole group's thinking, on problem solving, and you know, Molly brings up the, the ideas about what do you do for conditions if there's issues that are, are roadblocks to coming to an agreement. Um, the compact allows for this. You can approve a diversion with conditions. And so when there were places that were roadblocks, I wanted to, I mean, Grant was really sort of instrumental in highlighting, well, here's our opportunities. How are we gonna take what we're hearing from constituents and figuring out a way to address those issues that aren't, you know, create sort of a fundamental, you know, barrier to this meeting, the, the, but but how to, how to really get to that final endpoint. And so I think that's important. I also mentioned Eric Ebersberger's not here today, but he was my supervisor during this whole thing. And he was the lead negotiator for Wisconsin on this process. Um, and it's just, you know, it's tremendous. The number of people that called us and said, okay, we're trying to figure out this issue. Can you explain this topic? I always reference, we got a hundred questions from the jurisdictions during that initial period with the regional body. Um, all the states had their experts submitting questions and we used our environmental impact statement um, and then the technical review to provide responses to those questions. So the, the jurisdictions you know, took this really seriously and um, we had a lot of work <laughs> to do with it, um, but having there be such a comprehensive framework to work under um, really, you know, really was the key aspect of it. Right. Yeah, the compact and the agreement provided, you know, you referenced, Kate, the one line in, in, in the old federal legislation that just was not going to stand up. Well, in this case, we had the criteria, we had the standards, we had the broad process that we put more meat on the bones afterwards, but, you know, we had the broad process and it worked and we used it. And, um, I, and again, it was not the people who were on the table who used it. It was the folks afterwards. So that's, I mean, that's a good indication that uh, you folks really did your job because, you know, it, it wasn't based on the understandings of the people around the table. It was them looking at the legislation and working off of that and, and making it work. Those standards had never been applied before. And so I think that's one of the reasons Waukesha got so much attention because it really set the bar for how future uh, requests are going to be reviewed. So we're, we're almost out of time. Um, anybody has any questions? Any um, students or otherwise? Frank. Yes, I, uh, uh, in this whole process on, on Waukesha, something really important happened during that negotiation. And that is that uh, the tribes and First Nations, uh, even with this, uh, even into this process at the beginning, uh, we, were, uh, we were all considered uh, public when it came to public comments. And so the, the, the various drafts that were out there that were out for public comment, uh, we were held to those same standards. But we argued with the state of Michigan that we weren't public, we were governments. And that we needed to be able to have that have have input into this, and like a light bulb went on at the state house, and they said, "Oh yeah," which was you know sort of unusual because they don't usually do that. <laughs> but uh, this uh, what happened is is that we ended up uh, we ended up not being held to the public comment timelines, and we were actually negotiating and making comments right up to the day before the decision was voted on with the state. And many of the positions that we had taken in, in concert with Glyphwick and with the Chiefs of Ontario and other bodies working together, we came up, the comments we were making ended up being a significant part of the Michigan position then Michigan was what the lead negotiator in this. And it ended up being there to the, to the point where at a subsequent meeting with the governor, the governor publicly thanked the tribes for our efforts in bringing these comments to what ultimately became the decision for Waukesha. And that's a part of the story that not many people know, and I wanted to be sure to pass that on to everybody today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Frank. That's worth, that's worth applause. Christy. Hey.
And use this mic, Christy. Does that work? Yeah, I got it. Wow, thank you for the support. So Christy Meyer, Upriver Consulting. I was at the Ohio Environmental Council working with Molly and everyone else uh, and Kate Barter and Dick Bartz to get this passed. But my question is, um, one of the great things that also came out of uh, the Great Lakes Compact in Michigan was a water assessment tool. And I'm curious as to how that has been working. Has it been supportive in, a, in assessing and protecting the water resources? And if you know me, I'm an advocate. So could this be the next step into looking into how we continue to protect our Great Lakes and our Great Lakes states given the growing demands on water? It's a great question. Um, I have my answer. Do you, do you all want to comment on that? Where's Paul? I feel like there are better, there are there some people are. who are better positioned to comment on this. Yeah. James? Frank? Yeah. And John and Scott and James have all been involved. Yes, I, uh, I've been on the, what today is the water withdrawal, the water use advisory council, which works with the implementation of the water withdrawal assessment tool and uh, the implementation of the compact. And I've been on there. I wasn't on the original one. I think Paul is here in the audience. Uh, but uh, we, you know, they, the original one devising the tool. But then I've been on, I was a big critic of the tool at first. And, uh, but I've been on, of course, I got put on the committee to, a, to figure out how it's working. So <laughs> that, that was an interesting one. But it, the way it works, is that it's been doing a good job and it's been, we're constantly working on refining it, uh, getting better data for how we assess what the volume of water is. And this has been, uh, we're at the stage now where we're working on uh, what do we call water user groups, uh, committees in areas where we've determined that there's uh, perhaps no more water to be pumped because anything further will cause an adverse environmental impact. But this has been a really big issue going on, but it's ongoing. We have, uh, we're, we're having uh, yeah, committee meetings, monthly meetings of the Water, with Water Use Advisory Council that's part of the, the ongoing implementation of the project that you're referring to. So to my feeling is that this has been doing a good job of, uh, of figuring out how to make sure that we meet the goals within the, within the compact. And the other part of this is that, that it's providing a framework for how do we meet the challenges coming in the future. Because there are, you know, we have to figure out how to, how to, uh, uh, how to deal with issues where there appears to be a scarcity of water. The biggest issue we've had, and it's been in our reports to the legislature, has been how do you get people to conserve water when there's an abundance of water? People say, there's water everywhere. Why you got to have all these regulations? And so while this may be, this is a big issue, uh, we have managed to continue to do this, uh, to continue to work on the implementation through this. Uh, and the water withdrawal assessment tool is one of, it's an online tool for those that aren't aware of it, that people can go to get their permits for high capacity wells. And... Uh, they, we have determined through relatively complex things that are beyond me, often lost in cyberspace, uh, about how to determine how much water is actually there, and then how that, how much we can take out before there's an adverse environmental impact. And so the whole point of this is to try to see, try to not have adverse environmental impacts. And if there are likely to be one, then how do we get around that? And how do we make sure that people have access to water? And our big, one of our big issues is, of course, with, with riparian rights, that everybody has a, access to a reasonable use of the water that's on or near their property, like the, the streams or groundwater. And so this... Uh, this means that as more people want to use water, it means that we have to figure out how we can accommodate those additional uses. So there's going to be some challenges in the future, but as I think we've got a good framework, and, a, and the compact, I think, laid out that framework in a very good way for us here. So that's uh, some, Andy. Thank you, Frank. Um, 
Paul Seelbach here, and he's going to say like 30 seconds on this. All right, real quick. Hi, I'm Paul Seelbach, and at the time, I worked for the state of Michigan um, as part of the um, Water Withdrawal Advisory Council. So I want to say, so, so I helped develop the Water Withdrawal Assessment Tool that Christy referred to. Um, but it, but it was really a function of the council. So it wasn't a, a couple of scientists in the back, in the side room. The council sort of shepherded and developed the, the, the tool all the way along the, along the way. The reason I didn't speak up initially is I, I'm not as familiar with the current sort of status as I was back then. Uh, and that's, but that's, I, I have been looking at the emails and sort of peeking over the shoulders of the council that Frank just talked about that's been, so I think, I think what I'll say is that there's been a, tw a 15 year response of, in Michigan of forming a very serious, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pushback on how the tool works at, at, with some sectors and that's taken place through this council. So they've had discussions and this collaborative discussion has continued. So I think the good news is there was a framework. Um, it's promoted collaborative discussion for 15 years um, they have a whole, li they have lists of next things to be done, which are impressive and more modeling, more data, more, um, someone said earlier, Andy, that, you know, we finally connected groundwater and surface water. That was not true when this all started. Um, that's happening in these discussions. So it's been very healthy. There's now state funding significant for implementing that list just in the last couple of years. So the process has been great, but I don't know. Uh, numbers or anything like that. Paul, thanks. Uh, Paul was, I think it's fair to say, the father of the water assessment tool, um, and um, which received all these awards. And um, it's the Michigan legislature actually wrote a model, a water model, into state law. Uh, never seen it do that before. And um, as a result, um, you look at the implementing legislation and you look at the compact legislation, and you think there's the they don't even repeat the same language, and yet the implementing legislation is designed to make sure to meet those, those standards of the compact. And that happened in most states, which is why the genius of what, uh, what Molly and Pete and Shaylee were talking about is that these states had to be incredibly creative to make this work, and they were. And, and, and to a large degree, it is working. We can get into the critique, but maybe that's what we do for the future. Dave, are we, are we at time? Yeah. All right, thank you all. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you, Andy, and uh, I, I know we could stay here for a lot more time than we have today, but uh, if you do have follow-up questions that you're interested in having answered, please don't hesitate to contact me or Pete Johnson from our team, and we can connect you with uh, the panelists or anyone else uh, to make sure you get an answer. Uh, our final speaker for this morning's program is Liesl Clark. Liesl is the Director of Climate Action Engagement here at the School of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, I also had the pleasure of working with her when she was in her previous role as the director of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Liesl's going to talk a little bit about today's compact and uh, a little bit of a forward look uh, into some of the challenges of the future. So, Liesl. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. And I know I get to wrap you all up, but it's been such a very interesting two days um, to see so much of these conversations around the compact. I've really been impressed by the discussion. Um, when the compact negotiations were happening, um, I had the good fortune to be working for Governor Jennifer Granholm and seeing things um, from sort of uh, one or two circles uh, aside. Most of the heavy lifting was uh, Dana DeBell, Steve Chester, Ken DeBozart, um, you know, so many of the familiar people um, to all of you. And it was uh, very interesting and a very fascinating time to watch these conversations about our water, which is so critical to Michiganders, as we've heard here today. You know, these two days have been such an important acknowledgement of these collaborations. I think we cannot say enough the word collaboration bringing together multinational par or multidisciplinary parties, multinational parties to have these conversations and to build the framework. I think it's tough to see how something big like this gets done in the environment that we're in now. And that's one of the reasons why I think it is so important to bring everybody together to celebrate. 
I don't know that I'll be the last one to say it ever, but I might be the last one for the next uh, few hours. And I do want to say to everyone, congratulations on the work that happened and on that 15th anniversary of a durable document like this. I do want to take a second too and just thank our sponsors again. We've had our U of M sponsors up here, which is really wonderful to see the interest across campus. Um, but I also think that it's important to recognize um, the NGO and foundation sponsors that made being here possible and have supported this type of work and this type of research um, over the long term. So, you know, I can't get over the legendary names and faces that are in this room. Um, I had the good opportunity a few years ago to be at EAA for my friends from Wisconsin, which is the largest fly-in um, across North America, I believe. And it was, this one was about five years ago, six years ago. They had uh, NASA astronauts and crew from um, ground control during some of the early NASA launches do a panel. And I kept saying to my kids, you're never gonna get to see this again. You're never gonna get to see this again. And in some respects, um, I feel that way about these discussions the last two days, um, because you all are my NASA. Um, I think that being deeply seated in public policy as well as uh, water use and climate in Michigan, like that's how I have reflected on listening to all these conversations. And I really appreciate the acknowledgement of people in the audience, people that can't be with us. And I have to take a second and acknowledge Patty Burkholz, uh, who was just not more than a mentor to me and somebody that I miss on regular occasion, particularly over the four years um, that I had the good fortune to be leading the agency here in the state of Michigan. So when we talk about the compact that came into effect in 2008, one of the biggest pieces from, from my perspective was the way that it dealt with the water systems from a holistic perspective. And I don't think Paul's point about connecting groundwater to surface water can be taken lightly. Um, and it's something that I continue to see through the course of my, my time um, at, at Eagle. I think that connection is really critical um, because, of the, because it is all connected, because water is precious, Water is powerful, and as we heard uh, Congresswoman Dingle say this morning, uh, water is also very personal. And to have that connection uh, between groundwater, surface water, quality, and quantity, I think it is that holistic lens is really critical. So where do we go from here? The global pressure on freshwater systems are only going to continue to increase as populations grow and as uses grow. Um, I saw some stats from the IEA yesterday when I was looking. I'm like, oh, I'm going to see, find, find a little bit of material to deliver to all of you. My mother-in-law read my comments this morning. She said, well, it's a good, good thing you're not giving people a lot of data. I'm like, okay, I think that was like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> so a little bit of data. Um, I was really impressed when I was looking at these statistics. Two-thirds of the world's population faces water scarcity issues for at least one month a year. I mean, that's just a staggering statistic. I think we often um, don't understand um, the United, United States' place in the world, let alone um, North America's place in the world, the Great Lakes Basin, um, and how many people, how many people there are um, in this amazing world and that, and that pressure that will continue to impact on our, great, on our, on our fresh water. There was going to continue to be heightened scrutiny around how we manage water. It feels like you can't open a news resource anymore and see, um, you can't open anything and not see a story about, um, you know, what's going on with water pressures. Uh, there was a piece in the New York Times the other day about uh, ways that we're growing tomatoes with less water. Every time I opened LinkedIn, Drew Grunewald is doing a video telling me about water. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all over. It's everywhere we see. And the global, global pressure on our freshwater systems will just continue to grow. So our rights and our legal structure to water comes with that obligation to steward it. Again, something that you heard over and over the last couple of days. My tenure at Eagle, we had record high water levels. And that was very significant. We went from record low to record high in record time. Aaron says I shouldn't say that because it's not really the way it works. Um, but it was also shaped by that connectivity between groundwater and surface water and a more... Um, uh, more data behind that. We don't, we don't understand our groundwater as well as we need to here in Michigan. We have a lot more work to do there. Um, and it's astonishing to see during my term how we can have parts of Michigan struggling with just incredible high water issues at the same time as people are, being, are not able to get to water because we've got um, low water issues in other parts of the state at the same time. Again, why we need more data and research in order to understand this. And um, in my time in Lansing, 
um, water issues have uh, really changed dramatically. So I remember early in the 2000s, um, before some of the, uh, well, in the early compact conversations, but um, the beach grooming issues that were a uh, challenge here in Michigan. And I think that that looks a little different for our neighbors in other parts of the Great Lakes um, and our neighbors to the north, but you can certainly sympathize when it comes to dredging challenges um, as water levels fluctuate. Those are some pretty heated conversations um, and that, you know, again, really emphasized for me the need for more research and data. We're going to continue to have quality issues, you know, something that you heard from Mrs. Dingle again this morning. Michigan's been a leader in PFAS detection and in setting uh, regulatory levels for PFAS, but that's going to continue to be something that we ch need to chase and need to make sure that we're protecting our most vulnerable populations. And of course, the challenge of our changing weather patterns is gonna to continue to keep us all on our toes and require scientists and research to inform the public policy decisions that are made going forward. Again, data from the federal government shows the cost of weather and climate related disasters are just gonna to continue to climb as weather patterns change and we have uh, the struggles of dealing with too much water at some times. It's critical for the health of the Great Lakes systems that we respond to the climate and emergency by making sure that we're taking action to decarbonize. As you heard from John Allen, water, uh, the largest water user uh, in the Great Lakes region is thermodynamics. And while that is changing, um, it's something that has to continue to change. Sustainable agriculture is a good example of the water climate change nexus, and it highlights the important of conserva importance of conservation in promoting soil health and the ability there to capture uh, carbon in soils, something we need to spend more time on. Our discussion over the last two days reflects the past and is informed by the future, which allows us to help uh, influence what we know will be an unpredictable future, but we wanna have the right structure in order to respond to it. So turning to the future, I'd like to leave you with two calls of action for every one of you. The first is you have the ability to influence how quickly we decarbonize our economy. And it is a critical step that must be taken for the health of the Great Lakes. We have the tools, the recent, recent federal and state legislation to enable technology and support that decarbonization while we grow our workforce and our economy. We have to deploy energy efficiency. We've got to green the grid. We've got to transition mobility. We've got to think about ag and working lands as carbon sinks and other types of ways to um, capture carbon. We've got to do all of this urgently for the health of the Great Lakes. Secondly, you could make a difference in the voices that are involved in this discussion. We need to invite more people to this table. We need to have more vision next to us as Frank said, we need to have more participants and less observers. We need to make room at the table for more faces, new faces, faces that are impacted by water issues where we can learn from their perspectives and learned experiences. We need to bring in the next generations, which is why we're here and why we're glad to be doing this with students, and we need to bring in more. We need to also welcome the multilateral public policy conversations and engage and include our tribes and First Nations in a more robust way to make sure that we're thinking about it from a holistic perspective and that those perspectives are at the table. So finally, we celebrate the accomplishments of the past and the present while we manage to the future, even if that future is uncertain. We know that the root of the compact is to maintain the integrity of the great system, and we all must continue to pledge ourselves to this outcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Liesl. Um, so you've gotten a sense from everyone that you've heard from this morning uh, that this was important and you've heard about the pride in being involved in something important. Uh, so for you students, think about doing something similarly important as you enter into your career. And if you're looking for opportunities to connect with people and understand how to take advantage of those and make those opportunities available to yourselves, please, Talk with the people around the table. Talk to the people that were involved in this process and think about what that process for you may be in the future. It's been a great way to connect with one another. I've had some fun over the last couple of days. Uh, thank you to all the negotiators uh, who came and were a part of uh, the program over the last two days. Thank you to the students for, for being with us and uh, really look forward to the work ahead. It's been an honor and uh, I know with the future uh, in this room, uh, as it's represented with you, uh, the future will also be uh, looked after appropriately. So thank you very much.